Section 10 of Your Mind and How to Use It by William Walker Atkinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Classes of Concepts. In the preceding chapter, we have seen the process of conception, of the forming of concepts. The idea of a general class of things or qualities is a concept. Each concept contains the qualities which are common to all the individuals composing the class, but not those qualities which pertain only to the minor classes or the individuals. For instance, the concept of bird will necessarily include the common qualities of warm-bloodedness, featheredness, wingedness, oviparousness, and vertebrateness, but it will not include colour, special shape, size or special features or characteristics of the subfamilies or individuals composing the great class the class comprises the individuals and subclasses composing it the concept includes the general and common qualities which all in the class possess a percept is the mental image of a particular thing a concept is the mental idea of the general qualities of a class of things a percept arises from the perception of a sensation. A concept is a purely mental, abstract creation whose only existence is in the world of ideas and which has no corresponding individual object in the world of sense. There are two general classes of concepts, namely, one, concrete concepts, in which the common qualities of a class of things are combined into one conceptual idea such as bird, of which we have spoken. Two, abstract concepts, in which is combined the idea of some quality common to a number of things, such as sweetness or redness. Jevons' well-known rule for terms is an aid in remembering this classification. A concrete term is the name of a thing. An abstract term is the name of a quality of a thing. It is a peculiar fact and rule of concrete concepts that, one, the larger the class of things embraced in a concept, the smaller are its general qualities, and, two, the larger the number of general qualities included in a concept, the smaller the number of individuals embraced by it. For instance, the term bird embraces a great number of individuals, all the birds that are in existence, in fact but it has but few general qualities, as we have seen. On the contrary, the concept stork has a much larger number of general qualities, but embraces far fewer individuals. Finally, the individual is reached, and we find that it has more qualities than any class can have, but it is composed of the smallest possible number of individuals, one. The secret is this. No two individuals can have as many qualities in common as each has individually, unless they are precisely alike, which is impossible in nature. Imperfect Concepts It is said that, outside of strictly scientific definitions, very few persons agree in their concepts of the same thing. Each has his or her own concept of the particular thing which he or she expresses by the same term. A number of persons asked to define a common term, like love, religion, faith, belief, etc., will give such a variety of answers as to cause wonderment. As Green says, My idea or image is mine alone, the reward of careless observation if imperfect, of attentive, careful, and varied observation if correct. Between mine and yours a great gulf is fixed. No man can pass from mine to yours, or from yours to mine. Neither, in any proper sense of the term, can mine be conveyed to you. Words do not convey thoughts. They are not vehicles of thoughts, in any true sense of that term. A word is simply a common symbol which each associates with his own idea or image. The reason of the difference in the concepts of several persons is that very few of our concepts are nearly perfect. The majority of them are quite imperfect and incomplete. Jevons gives us an idea of this in his remarks on classification. Things may seem to be very like each other which are not so. Whales, porpoises, seals, 
and several other animals live in the sea exactly like a fish. They have a similar shape and are usually classed among fish. People are said to go whale fishing. But these animals are not really fish at all, but are much more like dogs and horses and other quadrupeds than they are like fish. They cannot live entirely under water and breathe the air contained in the water like fish, but they have to come to the surface at intervals to take breath. Similarly, we must not class bats with birds because they fly about, although they have what would be called wings. These wings are not like those of birds, and in truth, Bats are much more like rats and mice than they are like birds. Botanists used, at one time, to classify plants according to their size as trees, shrubs or herbs. But we now know that a great tree is often more similar in character to a tiny herb than it is to other great trees. A daisy has very little resemblance to the great Scotch thistle, yet the botanist regards them as very similar. The lofty growing bamboo is a kind of grass, and the sugar cane also belongs to the same class with wheat and oats. It is a matter of importance that clear concepts should be formed regarding at least the familiar things of life. The list of clear concepts should be added to from time to time by study, investigation and examination. The dictionary should be consulted frequently, and a term studied until one has a clear meaning of the concept the term seeks to express. A good encyclopedia, not necessarily an expensive one, in these days of cheap editions, will also prove very useful in this respect. As Halleck says, it must be borne in mind that most of our concepts are subject to change during our entire life, that, at first, they are made only in a tentative way that experience may show us, at any time, that they have been erroneously formed, that we have abstracted too little or too much, have made the class too wide or too narrow, or that here a quality must be added, or there one taken away. It is a good practice to make a memorandum of anything of which you may hear, but of which you know nothing and then later to make a brief but thorough investigation of that thing by means of the dictionary and encyclopaedia and of whatever good works may be obtained on the subject not leaving it until you feel that you have obtained at least a clear idea of what the thing really means a half hour each morning devoted to exercise of this kind will result in a wonderful increase of general information we have heard of a man who made a practice of reading a short article in the encyclopedia every evening, giving reference to subjects generally classed as familiar. In a year, he made a noticeable advance in general knowledge as well as habits of thought. In five years, he was looked upon by his associates as a man of a remarkably large field of general information and of more than ordinary intelligence, which verdict was a just one. As a rule, we waste far more time on worthless fiction than we are willing to devote to a little self-improvement of this kind. We shrink at the idea of a general course of instructive reading, little realising that we can take our study in small instalments and at a very little cost in time or labour. Our concepts form the material which our intellect uses in its reasoning processes. No matter how good a reasoner one may be, unless he has a good supply of general information about the things of which he is reasoning, he will not make much real headway. We must begin at the bottom and build a firm foundation upon which the intellectual structure may be erected. This foundation is composed of facts. These facts are represented by our clear and correct concepts. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 Judgments we have seen the several steps of the mental process whereby simple sensations are transformed into percepts and then into concepts or general ideas. The formation of the concept is considered as the first great step in thinking. The second great step in thinking is that of the formation of the judgment. The definition of judgment, as the term is used in logic, is the comparing together in the mind of two ideas of things and determining whether they agree or disagree with each other, or that one of them does or does not belong to the other. Judgment is, therefore, a. 
affirmative, or b negative, as a snow is white, or b all white men are not Europeans. What in logic is called a proposition is the expression in words of a logical judgment. Hislop defined the term proposition as follows. Any affirmation or denial of an agreement between two conceptions. For instance, we compare the concepts sparrow and bird and find that there is an agreement and that the former belongs to the latter. This mental process is a judgment. We then announce the judgment in the proposition the sparrow is a bird. In the same way we compare the concepts bat and bird, find that there is a disagreement, and form the judgment that neither belongs to the other, which we express in the proposition the bat is not a bird. Or we may form the judgment that sweetness is a quality of sugar, which we express in the proposition sugar is sweet. Likewise we may form the judgment which results in the proposition vinegar is not sweet. While the process of judgment is generally considered as constituting the second great step of thinking, coming after the formation of the concept, and consisting of the comparing of concepts, it must be remembered that the act of judging is far more elementary than this, for it is found still farther back in the history of thought processes. By that peculiar law of paradox, which we find everywhere operative in mind processes, the same process of forming judgments which has been used in comparing concepts, has also been used in forming the same concepts in the stage of comparison. In fact, the result of all comparison, high or low, must be a judgment. Halleck says, Judgment is necessary in forming concepts. When we decide that equality is or is not common to a class, we are really judging. This is another evidence of the complexity and unified action of the mind. Brooks says, the power of judgment is of very great value in its products. It is involved in or accompanies every act of the intellect and thus lies at the foundation of all intellectual activity. It operates directly in every act of the understanding and even aids the other faculties of the mind in completing their activities and products. Strictly speaking, every intelligent act of the mind is accompanied with a judgment. To know is to discriminate, and therefore to judge. Every sensation or cognition involves a knowledge, and so a judgment that it exists. The mind cannot think without judging. To think is to judge. Even in forming the notions which judgment compares, the mind judges. Every notion or concept implies a previous act of judgment to form it. In forming a concept, we compare the common attributes before we unite them, and comparison is judgment. It is thus true that every concept is a contracted judgment, every judgment an expanded concept. It is needless to say that as judgments lie at the base of our thinking and also appear in every part of its higher structure, the importance of correct judgment in thought cannot be overestimated but it is often very difficult to form correct judgment even regarding the most familiar things around us. Halleck says, In actual life, things present themselves to us with their qualities disguised or obscured by other conflicting qualities. Men had, for ages, seen burning substances and had formed a concept of them. A certain hard, black, stony substance had often been noticed, and a concept had been formed of it. This concept was imperfect, but it is very seldom that we meet with perfect, sharply defined concepts in actual life. So it happened that, for ages, the concept of burning substance was never linked by judgment to the concept of stone coal. The combustible quality in the coal was overshadowed by its stony attributes. Of course, stone will not burn, people said. One cannot tell how long the development of mankind was retarded for that very reason. England would not today be manufacturing products for the rest of the world had not someone judged coal to be a combustible substance. Judgment is ever silently working and comparing things that to past ages seemed dissimilar, and it is constantly abstracting and leaving out of the field of view 
those qualities which have simply served to obscure the pointed issue. Gordy says, The credulity of children is proverbial, but if we get our facts at first hand, if we study the living, learning, playing child, we shall see that he is quite as remarkable for incredulity as for credulity. The explanation is simple. He tends to believe the first suggestion that comes into his mind, no matter from what source. And since his belief is not the result of any rational process, he cannot be made to disbelieve it in any rational way. Hence it is that he is very credulous about any matter about which he has no ideas. But let the idea once get possession of his mind, and he is quite as remarkable for incredulity as before for credulity. If we study the larger child, the man with the child's mind, an uneducated man, we shall have the same truth forced upon us. If the beliefs of men were due to processes of reasoning, where they have not reasoned, they would not believe. But do we find it so? Is it not true that the men who have the most positive opinions on the largest variety of subjects, so far as they have ever heard of them, are precisely those who have the least right to them? Socrates, we remember, was counted the wisest man in Athens because he alone resisted his natural tendency to believe in the absence of evidence. He alone would not delude himself with the conceit of knowledge without the reality. And it would scarcely be too much to say that the intellectual strength of men is in direct proportion to the number of things they are absolutely certain of. I do not, of course, mean to intimate that we should have no opinions about matters that we have not personally investigated. We take, and ought to take, the opinion of some men about law, and others about medicine, and others about particular sciences, and so on. But we should clearly realise the difference between holding an opinion on trust, and holding it as a result of our own investigations. Brooks says, it should be one of the leading objects of the culture of young people to lead them to acquire the habit of forming judgments. They should not only be led to see things, but to have opinions about things. They should be trained to see things in their relations, and to put these relations into definite propositions. Their ideas of objects should be worked up into thoughts concerning the objects. Those methods of teaching are best which tend to excite a thoughtful habit of mind that notices the similitudes and diversities of objects and endeavours to read the thoughts which they embody and of which they are the symbols. The study of logic, geometry and the natural sciences is recommended for exercise of the faculty of judgment and the development thereof. The study and practice of even the lower branches of mathematics are also helpful in this direction. The game of checkers or chess is recommended by many authorities. Some have advocated the practice of solving enigmas, problems, rebuses, etc., as giving exercise to this faculty of the mind. The cultivation of the why attitude of mind and the answering of one's own mental questions is also helpful, if not carried to excess. Doubting Thomas is not always a term of reproach in these days of scientific habits of thought and the man from Missouri has many warm admirers. End of chapter 23 End of section 10